Welcome to Free Thoughts from Libertarianism.org and the Cato Institute. I'm Aaron Ross Powell, editor of Libertarianism.org and a research fellow here at the Cato Institute. And I'm Trevor Burris, a research fellow at the Cato Institute Center for Constitutional Studies. Joining us today is Michael Shermer. Dr. Shermer is founding publisher of Skeptic Magazine, executive director of the Skeptic Society and a columnist for Scientific American. He's the author of many books. His newest is The Moral Arc, How Science and Reason Lead Humanity Toward Truth, Justice and Freedom. Your book tells a story of moral progress and how that progress was driven not by philosophy or religion but by science. So before we delve into the details of that story, can you maybe just give us the big picture? Uh, the big picture is that um, after the scientific revolution, um, most thinkers in Europe w were inspired by Galileo, Newton, Harvey and so on and wanted to be the equivalent of that in their own fields. So Th Thomas Hobbes, for example, uh, Self-consciously said, I, "I, you know, I'm, I'm, the, I want to be the Galileo, the William Harvey of civil society." And his book *Leviathan* is one of the most important, influential political treatises ever written. And it, and it is a materialistic work, beginning with atoms in motion, all the way up to you know how we perceive things through our senses with atoms impinging on our senses and how we form simple ideas and simple ideas form compound ideas and and on and on he goes until you get to you know civil society now the Leviathan was supposed to be a three part work you know the the whole first part was just like the physics and biology and then the second part was psychology and then the third part was society but uh, he ran out of time so he just put it all into one <clears throat> but the point of that is that you know he's saying that we have a problem here. There's you know, too many issues in society. There has to be a way to solve these rationally, scientifically. So I'm, I'm going to do it this way. And he builds the best science of his day. And how did – what specifically had Harvey and, and Galileo and everyone done that was different? I mean we like to say science but – Yeah, well, so it's a naturalistic worldview that the, that the universe is materialistic, deterministic and there is no supernatural. There's just the natural. There's just natural forces and we can understand them. And, and that's what Newton did by you know, tying in celestial mechanics with terrestrial mechanics, basically arguing it's all knowable you know, and you can actually write equations to describe it. So therefore, the human mind is capable of understanding how the universe works and it's, and it's a mechanical process. So Hobbes' whole thing, his whole treatise is that it is mechanical. The, the, the atoms in motion ending up with a society you know, with a social contract and all that in the Leviathan, that, that is a purely materialistic, naturalistic uh, worldview. So, the, so this new contribution then that came about during the Enlightenment, not just in what we traditionally think of as science but in moral philosophy, was this new way of thinking that was taking – principles of reason, using principles of reason, but also not dependent upon any sort of supernatural stuff. Am I that's understanding right. that yep, correctly? Correct. Yep. Mm -hmm. I, so therefore, you're, you're really taking God out of the equation. Sure. Even though most people at the time weren't atheists, it, it, they were just saying that's a separate thing. Let's just talk about what we know, what we can know. It seems that different though to say the way that Newton talked about God is we can, we can understand all of this and still understand the behind – the world and the mechanistic operations, there can still be a god. Yes, yeah, uh, Newton was a believer um, or a deist or whatever he actually was by today's labels. But but it di didn't matter because he wasn't invoking God unless he needed to. Um, his attempt was to like close the gap, the god of the gaps arguments. He was re eliminating gaps by saying, "This is just gravity. This is gravity doing all this, and here I have equations to describe it." And so he eliminated a lot of the need for a deity. I'm curious this – you say that this came about during the Enlightenment, that this this new way of thinking about morality, you call it secular humanism. Uh -huh. um, but what you're describing sounds an awful lot like many thinkers before then. So I'm thinking of the Greeks, the Hellenistic philosophers. Mm -hmm. Aristotle mm -hmm. gave us a godless view of morality and humanity, mm -hmm. the Epicureans, the Stoics. Um, Buddhism arguably was mm -hmm. not yep. supernatural. So are those different somehow from what happened during the Enlightenment and well, after? Not, not, well, yeah, they're different in their specifics. Um, had those taken root, uh, we, we might be much further along now than we, we are. 
but there was that thing, you know, the Dark Ages. You know that book, The Swerve, mm-hmm. uh, in, in which you know, so the rediscovery of some of these old naturalistic texts from the ancient Greeks and and republishing them, and, and then those got got some traction, and all that was part of the scientific revolution, which which underneath it was this materialistic, naturalistic worldview. Um, so we we lost a few centuries. We'd probably be colonizing the galaxy by now. It is pretty astounding how much they destroyed in in the process of Christianizing yeah. the world. Uh, yep. And the Swerve is definitely a great book to talk about that. But and we we've been talking about science, but we also have these rights thing, which is maybe related to it or well, a separate I, I, vein. I think they are. I think so. I mean, most people think of rights as just a pure philosophical or metaphysical concept. Bentham famously described rights as nonsense and natural rights the as nonsense, nonsense, nonsense on stilts. On stilts yeah. Yeah. But, um, but he didn't have Darwin. He didn't have evolutionary theory. He didn't have you know, any sound theory of human nature like we have now. We understand much more than they did back then. As brilliant as those people were, you know, they didn't know, you know a fraction of what we know today. So I try to make the case in any any case in the moral arc for natural rights that that you can start – so you got to start somewhere. Um, so I start with the um, uh, survival and flourishing of, of sentient beings. So like Bentham, I use sentience meaning can, can, they, can you feel and suffer and, and experience pain? Because when we're talking about morality, we're talking about are, are, are people being harmed or helped? You know, interactions. If you're by yourself on an island, there's no morality. But, but um, so, it's the survival and flourishing of sentient beings. Why, why individuals? Because natural selection operates on the individual, and then um, why sentience? Because that that connects us to other species, and that's how brains operate. And um, and then I just use survival and flourishing because that's what natural selection does. It it, it gives us a drive to survive, and thrive, um, and flourish. As just part of our nature, and um, so you have to start somewhere. That's where I start. I, I know I, I know that most of my fellow atheist, skeptic, scientists don't agree with that. They they don't think it's possible to ground it in anything objective. That it's it really is culturally relative, even though they're personally not cultural relativists mm-hmm. or moral relativists, and they don't quite go that far. But but they always invoke Hume. You know, you can't the naturalistic fallacy. You can't go from the way things something is to the way it ought to be. But I, I say nonsense. We already do that mm. well, a lot. See, it seems weird to say though that it's my opinion that Hitler was bad, right? And most people don't. I mean, but 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 if you push them on something like that, they go, well, of course he was bad. Well, how do you know he's bad? Uh, well, in the you know, it's sort of a Western thing. Or if you push like female genital mutilation. Yes, of course I think that's terrible. But I, I can't completely condemn the Somalis for doing that to their women. Why not? This concept of flourishing is really important to your story because much of the, the book is talking about how we have increased flourishing, how we've gotten better at enabling people to flourish in the world. So can you tell us a bit more about what you actually mean by flourishing? What's, what does it mean for someone to flourish? What is necessary for someone to flourish? Um, physical and mental health, happiness, satisfaction, having fulfilling lives, relationships. You know, that, you know, that there's some subjectivity to how you might flourish and how you versus me or something. I like to go ride my bike. You like to do something else. You do something still else. That, that doesn't matter. It's just the idea of whatever makes you feel so f- fulfilled. Obviously, not murdering other people makes me feel you know, flourishing. Uh, you know that, that. First of all, that's super rare. And, and in any case, something else would trump that <clears throat> that we can get into later. But um, but but again, you have to start with something. And and the animal rights activists they they start with Bentham and you know it isn't it isn't important can they think or or have. Um, Intelligence or use tools. It's can they suffer and feel because that's really what we're talking about when you know the care of other people, people that need help, helping you know the moral aspect of humanity. And that's helped create an expanding circle as you described because you just mentioned animals and and uh, and different people that it seems that we've brought them into the yes the circle of care. Yep, I guess yep. would be the right way of putting it. I like the sphere as a metaphor because it's multidimensional versus a circle which is on a flat plane, but. Uh, but Peter Singer's idea that you know he he laid out in the early '80s, I think that's that's held up pretty well. That is what what we've been doing. Mm-hmm. So just think about incorporating um, uh, gay rights and same-sex marriage into the sphere. That's all we're doing. That, that's all they're asking. They just say, just let us do what everybody else. Just bring us into this circle, the sphere. 
and that's what we're doing. The uh, the use of government, so because this is now we get we kind of get to rights and how government relates to people, uh, and that's particularly what we're interested, of course, here at Cato and how the, how this uh, assertion against government and so and the, so we described Hobbes and how we get forward in the mechanistic view. How do you think this changed people's relation idea of the relationship between people and the government? Uh, with these new ideas of science and rights. Yeah, well, first of all, you wouldn't want to live in Hobbes' society. The uh, Leviathan no, no, no. is, is I'm pretty... not nearly strong enough, <laughs> and I have to sleep sometimes. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> it's pretty draconian. And uh, but but um, you know th th these are the hard issues. You know we can do the low hanging fruit that I that I do in my talks. Um, but you know to what extent should the state step in to intervene in somebody's private religious beliefs that diseases are not caused by germs but they're caused by negative thoughts and we should just pray you know, you, you know you're familiar with these cases and you know it, it, it's hard individual liberty versus um, the government protecting the you know the uh, those who can't protect themselves your notion of flourishing ends up I mean you talk about natural rights and it makes me think of the natural thought series of I'll cite a Catholic Thomas Aquinas who Kind of approached a similar sort of, mm -hmm. you know, we need to we need to think about what are the goods, what's good for a, a good life, um, and he looked to the things that were desired by everyone, and he came up with what procreation and life and knowledge mm -hmm. um, and sociability, which actually looks quite a lot like uh -huh. your list of mm -hmm. things, mm -hmm. um, and and so the idea then is, are we correct in is the morality that you argue similar? To his in the sense that then the things that are morally wrong or right are those things that enhance those necessary things for flourishing and those would be the good things and then things that are morally wrong are the things that undermine those necessary constituent parts it's of flourishing. It's a place to start. It's a good place to start. But of course you're going to find exceptions to that. You know, the person that flourishes from torturing animals or you know the psychopath that or the sadist or masochist and you know just yes of course there are those so we have to make exceptions but for the most part it's a good place to start interestingly in your book um, you when you taught the animal rights chapter um, about I don't know, maybe Two thirds of the way through it, or so, you just come for and say, "I need, I, I do eat meat, and I yes, wear animals." I, and I, I, I that would kind of surprise yes. me. Uh, I had, I had a meat sandwich today. <laughs> I know. Well, uh, we're, we're all inconsistent. Oh, of course, uh, yeah, yeah. I, I routinely tell people, like, if I were a better person, I would be a vegetarian. Yeah. but I, my will is not strong enough. And I mean, the animal rights and... activists have good arguments. They really do, they're, they're, and they follow pretty much on the footsteps of all the great rights revolutionaries in the past. The arguments they made against. Abolition of slavery and women's right to vote and, and so on. And so I, I can't say that they're wrong. Uh, what makes it hard is that we have to eat. You don't have to have a slave. You can flourish just fine without a slave. Um, but you have to eat. And uh, so now where I live in LA, there's tons of great vegan restaurants with really good food. But but you know, it's the other times it's hard to not eat meat and it's tasty and you know that makes it hard. Uh, so for a while I didn't, you know, when I was writing that chapter anyway, uh, because you know I watched all those awful, awful hidden camera oh, documentaries, horrible, absolutely, yeah. factory farms, and oh, just you know I had to like cover my eyes and peek through my fingers to see what was going on, on the screen, and uh, you know there you don't want to do it because it's really bringing it home. Uh, but that's what the whole point of it is, you know. You want to like Harriet Tubman's, you know, Uncle Tom's Cabin. The whole point of that was just to make people aware of this is what it's like. And then you read it. So this is the argument about literacy and rights revolutions. You know, just making people aware of what it's like to be in that condition. And oh, you know, and that's that. So all rights revolutionaries since then have tried to put people interchange perspective, put pe people into that position to see how you would feel. How do you think this is? You mentioned two things that were interesting, like in terms of not eating a slave or needing uh, meat. Uh, it's something we talk about a lot here. Cato is you know, the growth of human prosperity, and it's in your book, the hockey stick graph. Yeah. But there seems to be a, a relationship between the moral arc, as you're describing it, and prosperity. There are some things that you may not be prosperous enough to care about. Uh, you talk that, about the walrus right. hunters yeah. in your yeah. in the animal chapter. So maybe it's it, poor, poor people have a hard time being moral in many situations. Well, that's right. I mean, if you live in Africa, I mean, who cares about the you know, animal rights? Uh, I don't have any rights, <laughs> you know. So you gotta you gotta get your. So the, yeah, the solution is is we gotta make these people prosperous and successful, and and you know then they'll get education. I mean, with democracies comes better education. With free markets comes more money for better education, and, and then with that comes all the other 
uh, goodies. And so, yeah, you got to start somewhere. Which is why I, I, I like the Gates Foundations. You know, they're they're not going for these lofty utopian things. They're just saying, let's see if we can just eliminate this one thing right here, and let's see if we can you know, have a, a better toilets. And just really basic stuff that allow people then to care about the next level up. Um, and eventually, you know, we'll get to the caring about the environment. But, but in any case, the more educated you are, the less, the fewer children you have, and therefore less uh, you know, pressures on the environment. So again, just get people to get China, get China through the industrial revolution as quick as possible, and get them up to speed on renewables and whatever they got to do to get their population under control. And that that that's progress. So then, as part of the story of progress, is it that? Increasing wealth is what leads to moral progress or is it – which is what you've just been talking about, that they need to be – we need to get them to certain levels of income so that then they can start caring about these things or is it that the moral progress is what results in the increasing wealth or is it somewhere in between? Uh, well, it's both but you know the, 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 the hockey stick curve comes a bit after – the rights revolutions and the humanitarian revolutions had already been well underway. So it's not – that's probably not the cause. It's probably interactive and they're both caused by something else and then it feeds into it in a positive way. Um, for a while, I was toying with the you know life is hard theory of of why people are mean and nasty, you know, because who cares? You know, life is so grim. But as Pinger points out, you could just easily make the opposite argument that if you know life is grim, then I'm really going to feel bad for you because I know what it feels like to be poor and and diseased and and, and miserable. So it, it, it isn't clear which way it should go. And in any case, the whole uh, the whole increase in wealth after the industrial revolution comes well after you know the rights revolution. Are, we're already underway, so you know we're looking at something else. Um, but all all things being equal, it's better to be prosperous and wealthy than not, for a whole bunch of other reasons that helps propel it along faster. I was I confess that as I was reading through it, being a little bit uncertain at times, precisely what you meant by moral progress that we were tracking, because at sometimes I there's the question of do you mean progress in the sense of our values, the, the, those things that we think are morally valuable are changing, getting better in some way. Poor values are being replaced with better values. Um, or do you mean it in the sense that like in your – you could expand on what this means, your um, – what is it? The witch theory, which theory of, cause, causality. of causality. Yes. Yeah. That, that in that instance, what you're, you, which you describe as progress, like abandoning the witch theory of causality is, is moral progress. But in there, what you're saying is – it's better we our underlying moral values haven't changed. We still people thought it was not okay to harm um, or that it was okay to stop people from harming, but their data changed. Their their knowledge of the world changed such that they now yes. don't think what they thought was harm wasn't actually harmful. Trevor That's what I mean by moral progress mostly. And also very specific measurable things, decline in homicides, abolition of slavery, the expansion of rights for women and blacks and so forth. Very specific measurable things instead of something a little more metaphysical like you know what? We have different moral values, but what does or the it mean? rights revolution? The rights would be, yeah, but even there, the rights. Well, what are we talking about? The right to vote. Okay, so I can go in and actually stamp a ballot. You know, so that's an actual specific thing. Or I'm less likely to die, or be enslaved, or tortured, living today than I w had I lived centuries ago, and uh, or thousands of years ago. So these are just very specific. You know, in instances like that. I, I'm not a philosopher. I'm a science guy. So, you know, I'm looking at things that are quantitative, measurable. You know, let's just. You know, life is better if you have three square meals a day rather than two. If you make ten thousand a year versus six thousand a year. You know, just North Korea, South Korea, very specific things. They're three inches shorter. That's not good. I can exactly. see the difference. Okay. Okay. That form of that moral progress. What are some of the, I guess, most striking examples? The biggest examples of moral progress that you talk about? Right. So um, as I mentioned, you know, the abolition of slavery, the, uh, you know, the various rights revolutions, humanitarian revolutions that abolished torture and the death penalty, which is almost gone. Um, those kinds of things, just you know, the decline of war, the number of people that die in war, the percentage of populations that die in conflicts, the number of conflicts that there are between Western powers has you know, declined dramatically. All of those add up to 
I'm less likely to die and I'm more likely to flourish. And again, I, I don't like talking about groups like you know this race or that nation or that gender. It's you. It's me. It's an individual person that's less likely to be harmed or killed and more likely to be prosperous and flourish and that's, that's my measure, my criteria. It, it's striking that when you look back at uh, I mean, people at 16th century, 17th century, sometimes you wonder if everyone in the society were, were sadists, that, that, whether public ex- executions, bear baiting, the kind of thing that they thought was a good time right. and is now absolutely reprehensible. It does seem like something is, is going on. Okay, That would be an example of something like a value, I suppose, that uh, we don't think it's fun, <coughs> fun anymore <coughs> excuse me, to torture uh, cats or bear baiting, you know what? So there, our our sentiments have have expanded to being concerned about the welfare and and suffering of other sentient beings like dogs and bears, cats and bears. So that would be progress in a, in a value, a moral value, uh, in a very measurable way. Yeah, I think that's absolutely true. The interesting thing that Aaron and I were talking about before was, you know, in Aristotle, for example. It's it's unclear, and I think your book does a pretty good job of explaining this. He thinks that there are natural slaves, but he thinks that they need to be slaves because it helps them flourish. So perhaps he's just making a, a scientific factual. error, yeah, a that's factual right. yeah, error, that's right. and so and that's why like the witch causality, people are just getting better at understanding that this is the same type of thing as this. Another criteria is to ask the affected party how they would feel. Like, hey, I'm pretty sure you'll be flourishing better as a slave. What do you think? Uh-huh. Uh, no, I, re- I actually don't really think that. <laughs> or the woman. How about we torture you? Know, t- torture you on the on the pyre there? N- no, I actually don't really want to do that. And then we get, but then we get to the difficult questions because one thing from the libertarian standpoint that that struck me in your book, and and I don't th- do you think you consider yourself totally libertarian, but friendly or whatever. Yeah, the, the, yeah but, but small the, L libertarian, small libertarian L, maybe. Yeah. But there seems to be a danger in in there. Possibly someone could read it incorrectly. That the misuse of science, the overuse of science to the point of trumping rights, that that because science has been used for some really horrible things, eugenics, yes, for example, right. and things like this, and and the idea that there are some people who have the idea that science is so right that perhaps we should just make more bureaucracies, more technocracies, turn uh, the rule over to scientists, turn the rule over to scientists, central planning, all these things. And if you get too encumbered, one thing that the Dinesh D'Souza's of the world can kind of occasionally make a very small point about is that places like the Soviet Union tended to be incredibly science-driven type of bureaucracies mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. even if it was perverted. So how would you respond mm-hmm. to that? Right. Well, of course, when, when you phrase it that way and we envision the lab coat guy out there with his calibers you know, saying this race is inferior to that race or whatever. <clears throat> so first of all, <clears throat> the whole eugenics thing was mistaken anyway. It was, it, it's wrong. It's pseudoscience. But even if it turned out it was right and let's say blacks really are inferior to whites or whatever your preferences there. Um, but still the idea of rights for all sentient beings would trump that that idea that even though you think – this is this is the problem with utilitarianism. It's too easy to make the trolley calculation. I'll flip the switch for the trolley to save the five workers and kill only one worker. Almost everybody agrees. Yeah, that, that seems right. And uh, but but then it's easy to go from well I'll kill these one million people to save these five million people or kill these ten million people to save the fifty million people and all of a sudden you have a, you know wow. you, you, you have a genocide yeah. and uh, so that's the problem with utilitarianism and it's the problem with um, allowing cert- like just deeper more important principles like rights to be trumped by just some scientific theory even if it turned out it was right um, but even there. See, I'm, I'm making a case for natural rights that we can these – these are things we discover about our human nature, that we have this desire to flourish and, and, and survive and, and therefore, again, you have to start somewhere. <laughs> so I start there and uh, and from there I can say, well, we discovered natural rights. We discovered that this is through study and research that this is what people really like. This is what helps them survive and flourish. And there's a huge body of literature now on happiness. Uh, tons of books about it. You know what people need. You know they they need meaningful work, family, friends, social connections, and um, you know some kind of spiritual or you know a deeper fulfilling purpose to your life. That kind of thing. Okay. Um, well, we know that now. <laughs> mm-hmm. So there's all sorts of things we shouldn't do because it you know reduces that. Let me ask a question related to something you said, but I fear maybe slightly off topic. Um, but I think it's on a topic that I hope is of interest to our audience. It's 
We're sitting here with the editor of Skeptic Magazine who is famous for debunking pseudoscience, for distinguishing actual science from pseudoscience. And You're I know, very, very good at that, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and and this – I mean we're inundated every day with all sorts of claims that – claim to be scientific, statements that you know we've got to do this, we've got to do that and there's science behind it. Mm -hmm. So just for for those of us living in the world and exposed to this stuff, what is the difference between science and pseudoscience and how do we tell? <laughs> right. Well, this turns out to be a hard problem because uh, it, it's what Karl Popper called the the um, – uh, the boundary problem that, that you know you can cl clearly see something that's super extreme that's just crazy that's not true psychic power or something like that but there's a lot of gray areas in there that it's not quite clear you know cold fusion you know what was that string theory is you know it's not it's not quite science it's not really pseudoscience it's in that gray area um, and so it ends up being something of a social construction of you know good science is what most scientists accept and practice it, it leads to a working hypothesis and, and paradigm that you can run experiments in and test and it's useful and it, it's been verified and corroborated from others and so on. And pseudoscience claims tend to be you know, isolated. No, uh, they're, they're, they, don't t they don't give you any testable hypotheses. They're just assertions and speculations and conjectures. And, uh, and so that, that, that's kind of the difference. And, and it, so it varies depending on which particular claim you're talking about. So like in alternative medicine, we deal a lot with this. There is no alternative medicine. There's just medicine that's been tested and, is, and scientific, and then there's everything else that's just claims. Yes, medicine that's been proved to work is alternative medicine that's been proved to work is called. That's right, medicine. medicine. That's right, right, <laughs> exactly right. Um, and uh, so you know, there. I mean, even skeptics disagree on certain you know things about what what science or pseudoscience. And also, calling something pseudoscience has become something of a badge of you know of of uh, really scolding somebody for believing something crazy. It's a pejorative term, uh, like like calling something a conspiracy theory. Well, there are conspiracies, so some of the theories are going to turn out to be right. Yeah, MK Ultra, MK Ultra really set back a lot. It gave conspiracy theorists a lot of uh, of energy, kind of like how the the coelacanth has let cryptozoologists oh, yes. be right. able to yeah. say about anything, well, it could be a coelacanth right. or a mountain gorilla. There was one That's period right. where they did not right. believe that That's and now right. they just run away with it forever. Yep. Right. But your question – your claim about, about scientists and, and scientific thought, I have to ask this question not because I really believe it but it brings up the global warming question, uh -huh. yeah. um, uh, which I, I have I, – I'm not qualified to have huge opinions about global warming, but the, but you hear the question of well, how is science done by consensus? There has to be someone out there who could be right and goes against the consensus. Well, that's right, and, and that does happen occasionally, but not not as often as you think. Uh, most people on the margins or <clears throat> the heretics, they're, they're usually wrong about their ideas. You just don't hear about it because. Well, they were wrong and they don't get published or nobody pays any attention to them because they're, they're not useful ideas. They don't lead to anything. Um, so the idea, you know, well, they laughed at Galileo and they laughed at the Marx Brothers. Well, they laughed at you – know, or they laughed at the Wright Brothers. They laughed at the Marx Brothers. Being yeah, laughed at <laughs> you know, doesn't really make any difference. Um, you ultimately, have to be right at, at some level get, by which I mean corroborated by other people. So the reason uh, climate scientists talk about this, 97 percent of climate scientists agree global warming is real. The reason that's done – I mean that's not normally done. You never hear something like – you know, 97 percent of scientists agree that – Saturn has 13 million yeah, or something like right. that. Yeah, yeah you, you don't have to do that because it's not controversial. It only comes up because you know, people on – the 3 percent are making a lot of noise and, and only because there's some political economic ramifications that people feel it threatens their worldview. Nobody cares about the germ theory of disease or the plate tectonics theory of geology. That doesn't stir up political uh, animosity amongst people. So. It's only to that extent that we even talk about that. But, but the consensus process is an interesting one. This was um, you know, the sociology of science and the history of science. You know, they talk about, well, what, what does lead to a paradigm shift? And you know, occasionally um, the young guys get a toehold with a new theory and then they oust the old guys in the old theory. But that only happens if they are also right. And like Einstein, you know, replaced Newton. No, no, actually, Newtonian mechanics is just fine. It just doesn't work out on the extremes, and so you need a refinement of that, which is Einstein relativity, and 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 we need further refinements with quantum mechanics. And okay, so there's more to come, but but it's not like one's replacing the other. They're just sort of layered on top of 
uh, layers. This is the, the, that's what the, the scientist, the scientism being governing our lives, and then we mentioned China um, and the rights of people in China. And, and the big question is when do you override these rights? I mean, that's what you mm -hmm. mentioned. That's a really mm -hmm. difficult question, and that becomes a difficulty in terms of when do we for global warming to override the rights of poor Chinese people to get cheap uh -huh, energy. Right. Um, is there – is there? Yes, a, I agree. That's a, that's a, pro, that's a naughty um, political problem. Can science answer that question? Yeah, though? well um, – When we should do that? Well, not at the moment. We can't. Uh, I mean you can make projections and employ the precautionary principle, which I don't like because it, it stifles innovation too, too much. I'd rather see us go, let the Chinese do whatever they want, but let's get them better technologies. In fact, let's do the Elon Musk approach. Let's just have all electric cars and let's just solve all these problems with better technology as opposed to going backwards. The harder to go backwards, better to go forward, especially if there's a, a profit incentive. Or even just a, a value incentive. I mean, Elon Musk gave away the patents for all his electric cars. You know, he has a bigger goal. He has to make a profit because it's a company. But, uh, but his bigger goal is let's make the world a better place. And you know, okay, so that's a great example of what John Mackey calls conscious capitalism. You know, capitalism is good. It's okay to make a profit. Nothing wrong with making money. But we we, we could also have other cool values too and add on to that. You talk about governments providing the the rule of law and a structured system of uh, criminal code punishment and that being a really important thing for us to flourish. Um, but in the book, you also discuss the possibility that, that governments themselves might become obsolete at some point and that moral progress might result in say the triumph of cities over larger governments. Um, can you talk a bit about that? Mm -hmm. Yep. So before I wrote this book, I was always a small government libertarian. You know, just the smaller the better. I just people just want to be left alone. Turns out not everybody just wants to be left alone. <laughs> I've got a lot of letters about that, by the way. I don't want to just be left alone. I want somebody to take care of me. Oh, okay, <laughs> all right. Uh, well, the, the, go join a religion then, or something. You know. Uh, but what I discovered, in, you know, through Pinker's book and other historical works, that in fact government was a good thing in, in terms of. Uh, removing the whole self-help justice thing and it, which causes a lot of violence and uh, homicide rates to be pretty high. Again, I'm just looking at very specific measurable things. Homicide rates are super high. How can we get them lower? Well, one thing is to have better policing, better rule uh, – enforcement of the rules and laws, better courts, better judicial system and so on. Yeah, it's probably better if you don't just go shoot someone because they stole something from you and right. that's, yeah, and that's yeah. up to you to do that. The, yes. Right. Now – but of course, uh, governments can be abusive, and they, they have been. Uh, but not all of them. So, again, it's like um, it's sa you're saying religion's the problem. It's too broad. You know, religion is a whole bunch of different things. It's, you can't say government's the problem. Uh, well, which governments? You know, some are way worse than others. And uh, you know, so the whole point of the political process is to try to refine it better and better. And uh, I think we have been getting better over the long run at, at doing that. You know, uh, I mean, police. You know, police departments now have all these really like intelligent database, data based policing. You know, it, 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 really interesting programs in L.A. where, like, if a crime happens at this intersection here, you know, that increases by fifty percent. That another one will happen within a block of there. So you send the cops there before the next one happens, and then that stops it. You know, they just know from data analysis, the big data, and some more of that kind of thing. Again, very specific things like that. Um, and then, so my long-term prediction, I'm just speculating in the last chapter of Protopia. You know, I don't know what's going to happen any more than anybody else, but um, that uh, that kind of problem solving can happen better at the local level. So, and then you know, people like um, the Long Now Foundation, uh, Stuart Brand, and you know, these guys are talking about cities. Cities is the, where the action is, and now more than fifty percent of the world lives in cities. And um, you know, when mayors rule the world, is this book I cited, uh, and it, it's because that's where the I call it the fixing the pothole problems. Again, I, I just want to be left alone, except for just you know, let's fix certain problems that need to be fixed. And if there's no would, Democrat or Republican way to fix a pothole. That's right. To rip off of the Laguardia's uh, old quote. That's right. Yeah, yeah uh, absolutely. That's right. So, uh, in the long run, I think it would be better if governance happened more locally. Now that we have improved technologies of governance, we know how to do it better. You know, that's a that's a science. It's a you know, how, what's the best way to govern a group of people? You know, we we've tried everything for you know thousands of years, and we've got it down now. So, you know, the idea of the, the problem with the nation state is that it's it's too large and nefarious, and 
and nebulous and it could be nefarious and you, you get these antiquated notions of glor- the glory of war. You know, it's just such an inane idea. Glory for who? Yeah. I mean there is no na- – you know, it's just me and you. It's a bunch of people. And um, w- w- you know, the glory of the pre- – what does that do for me? And uh, so again, the individual is the target and I think the mayor is going to care more about me than the president. And maybe the you know the mayor's assistant will care even more about me. You know, just local. So I I think that could happen. I'm not sure. You know, if you look at the consolidation of states from you know thousands and thousands down to a couple hundred over the last 500 years, um, you know the, the one worlders have sort of predicted. You mean there were far more states? <laughs> yeah, yeah it was further in political the past. units. Political units. Yeah. Small political units. So like units. 600 AD, there were a ton of small little governments. That's right. Yeah. Now yeah. and in Europe, there was you know something like 5,000 different political uh, entities in 1500. So isn't that what I'm talking about? No, because they didn't know what they were doing. First of all, they just had walled cities and they were just constantly at war with each other. Like just Tuscany and in Italy, for example, just constantly yep. at war with each other. Yep, yeah, that's right. Just you know, so we don't do that anymore. We've gotten past that now that we have the technology of how to build a society and infrastructure and governance. Um, so going forward, maybe we'll bounce off the, at, at the bottom instead of having a one world government where now I have to depend on somebody who lives 10,000 miles away to care about me and they don't. Um, just just back back up to you know thousands of small political units, city-states. I'm wondering how we make people uh, – governing sorts of people, so the people who might even be in charge of these small city-states – the people care who about actually that run, sort of thing. The people who run for president. So this people. is, I mean, yeah. this is an issue that we talk a lot about on the podcast. Is I mean, we can say like we, you know, it would be great if people's lives were better, and there are these obvious ways that we can do it. But one of the problems with government is that the people get in, and there are all sorts of other incentives, yes, right? Right. And so we can this. I mean, this gets back to those kind of two possible ways of looking at moral progress, right? The like we we know what the moral thing to do is and we just need the better information on how to do it, which is kind of I mean what you're describing like if, you know, governments that they just know how to make how to govern correctly and we just need to implement it. But then there's also the changing of the the values because there are people out there, lots of people running states who know this sort of stuff, mm-hmm. but they want to protect their friends, they want right. to give them subsidies, or I happen to think what's you know helping my particular class. I convince myself is in the interests of everyone. Like I've, I've shrunk that moral right. circle. Right. Well, the solution is a so- social technological one. Uh, you just have more checks and balances. Two signatures on a check rather than one, <laughs> or maybe three. It should be three signatures on a check before you can cash it, and uh, you know so- something like that. Just so the founding fathers, you know, the best things they did was you know to break up the power structure and have more checks. And balances, and probably even more in terms of you know corruption. That's a big problem. There's no reason to think that you know you and I sitting here, fully aware and con- conscious of how corrupt people can be, and how bad that is. If we had the power reins, that we would not just go ahead and take care of our family and friends, just like you know the temptations are super strong given human nature. So that's why you need an, <clears throat> the outside source. And we're recording this. The when I was interjecting with Aaron, there we're recording this the day after the State of the Union. So this is a particular day when libertarians feel that everyone just had a massive de- national delusion for about 59 <laughs> minutes last night and we had to watch it and grit our, grit our, grit our teeth of the whole thing. But at the same time, Aaron's point being that we watch this man stand up and talk about us as a family and how we have a common purpose and uh-huh. this overuse of the term we and how he's yep. driving the bus the entire time. For the, and people seem to believe this stuff, which is the sort of the, the question of whether or not the moral arc can bend away from thinking that – that's the kind of situation we want to have. We want someone to all address us and be the national father. And well, some people do like that. Absolutely. I mean, the libertarians are we, we are few in number for for many reasons, but that's one of them. You know, some people like the idea of a sort of a patriarchal led community is going to take care of me. Uh, but, but but that's also something you get used to or not. Um, people grow up, you know, accustomed to public education, for example. So when I when I use the phrase government schools. Versus private schools, people are like. What do you mean government schools? I don't send my kid to a government school. Well, actually, you do. They're public, right? Yeah, but that's not a. Oh, okay. <laughs> <clears throat> I mean, and, and these are the same people that are you know super critical of say super critical of government and say, well, I know governments always mess things up. Then why would you want to send your kid? This is the most important thing you will ever do as a parent is educate your kid, and you're just turning that over. To people you know are incompetent. You know, okay, so um, you know something like that. I forgot what the question was, but <laughs> it, I mean, what you're describing is 
brings us back to why the argument, why your vision of smaller city states handling everything locally oh. is so appealing because it looks like you can say, yes, you you might want this cradle-to-grave welfare state. You may think that's good. You may want these kind of national greatness plans and all that. And if you want that, there's a community there for you. Run by Michael uh, Bloomberg. Yes, right. And if, if, I want, if I want this other community that sticks to you know, a night watchman state and just protects rights, I can do that. And then we can, we can look. We can see like are you actually working? Is it working out for you or is it working it's, out? But exactly. this is Robert Nozick's utopia yep. of utopias yep. idea. Well, there um, – like I like Sam Harris's metaphor of the moral landscape, the title of his book, in, in which instead of looking for one single answer, multiple peaks on the moral landscape, some slightly better than others or whatever, but there's lots of solutions of ways to live. So libertarians are fond of these proprietary communities where – you know, you like the community where no one's allowed to paint their door red, and you like it where everybody can paint their door any color they want, and so you live in the one and you live in the other, and you know that that actually could work in in principle. Uh, I think it it does it does work. I mean, there's you know hotels or private proprietary communities that have roads, not only literal roads but vertical roads, elevators, and you know they have shops and places to get your hair cut. You can almost live in some of these these Vegas hotels. You could actually never leave, which is the whole point. <laughs> <laughs> that they don't want you to leave. Uh, and so those are like mini cities, and, and th there's no reason why you couldn't extend that idea out. Now, of course, the rebuttal. Well, what about the terrorists with the nuclear bomb? That's gonna, okay, well, obviously, we ha this is going to take a while. You have to eliminate those problems with better technologies. Your position seems to be within the scientific, skeptical, atheist community that is your uh, My community. People. You thrive in your people. <laughs> I imagine that, as opposed to the sort of one government type of view. Uh, in my what just my little sense of the community it's more common to look at sort of the one government view not like new world order but that the progress is synonymous with more government than it is to have this sort of decentralization more libertarian mm -hmm. view yep. um, how does that how can we better convey this to that community these ideas that decentralization might work better uh, in terms of solving these problems and might create a better and brighter future well one way i i've tried to do it is to um, um, you know, that community all recognizes the power of bottom up um, through evolution. You know, evolution operates through these. You know, there, there is no central designer. There's no intelligent designer. <laughs> you know, we've debunked that idea. <clears throat> you know, natural selection is the designer from the bottom up, and in a way, the economy is like that, or the social systems are like that. They're self organized. Um, even pirate societies. I've been writing about that in the book because of uh, Pete Leeson's. You know, you know, it turns out these are organized societies. They have to be. You know, it's too costly if everybody just does whatever they damn well please and, and kills each other. It's a it's a net loss for the whole organization, right? So we got to have rules, and that does happen. So I try to show um, my fellow liberal atheists, you know, that 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 top down solutions are not always the best ones, and. The intelligent designer is is debunked, and so the intelligent designer in government is is maybe not always the right thing to do either. I don't know to what extent that works, because <laughs> uh, ever since I called started calling myself a libertarian, I found out people just quit listening to you. They just go, "Oh, you're just a libertarian." Okay, I don't have to think about what you're saying. So sometimes I wish I hadn't said the word, <laughs> just so that people would listen to the specific arguments you're making, because the you know the labels they really stick. And their uh, linguistic shortcuts to having to think. Thank you for listening to Free Thoughts. If you have any questions or comments about today's show, you can find us on Twitter at Free Thoughts Pod. That's Free Thoughts P O D. Free Thoughts is a project of Libertarianism.org and the Cato Institute, and is produced by Evan Banks. To learn more about libertarianism, visit us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.